Now in this video we're thinking about some of the innate mechanisms of immunity related to the normal anatomy and physiology of the body. So innate mechanisms. These are non-specific. They will act against a wide variety of potentially infecting organisms. And the first one, I think we'll go from top to bottom here. We notice that there are tears. So it's very important that the eyes are kept moist and the tears help to keep the surface of the eye moist and stop it from cracking out and that prevents infection. So moist eyes are important. Dry eyes are more prone to infection. And another one of the reasons, as well as the physical moisture, is that the tears contain lysozyme. Now lysozyme is an enzyme which is effective against bacterial proteins. So lysozyme will help keep the eyes free from infection. And as well as that, in tears, there's a certain amount of immunoglobulin secreted, immunoglobulin type A, which also has antibacterial and antiviral properties. And if the eyes are not free from infection, the conjunctiva, the layer in front of the eye, becomes inflamed. And this is called conjunctivitis. And the eye looks red and inflamed. We can see the dilated blood vessels in it. And the patient says it feels gritty and it's a very unpleasant condition. Now, there's hair and uh, mucous membrane in the nose. Now, the hair might sound a bit irrelevant, but um, hair keeps out insects, as long as we're breathing through our nose. Now, you've probably been breathing through your mouth and breathed in an insect. It's actually quite easy to do. So, um, hair in the nose actually protects us against insects, and the hair's also lined with mucus, so it's sticky. And inside the nose, we have a large internal surface area with the infolded nature of the nasal cavities. So we have a lot of mucous membrane, which is sticky and bacteria and viral particles will physically stick to that. And again, the mucous membrane secretes a certain amount of immunoglobulin type A as well. So there's a lot of mucous membranes in the body. A mucous membrane is just a membrane which uh, is lined with mucus, which of course is, is protective. Now, in the mouth, there's saliva, and there's also a lot of what we call commensal bacteria uh, in the mouth. So, a commensal bacteria, it, it's just there, it doesn't do any harm. Um, but the advantage of these commensal bacteria is, is, in a sense, they're actually symbiotic, because the commensal bacteria um, will occupy the etiological niche, which could otherwise be occupied by infecting bacteria. So if a potentially infecting bacteria comes into the mouth and it finds this commensal bacteria there, it's got no space to colonise the mouth because it's already full of commensal bacteria, which do us no harm in, in most circumstances. But this is one reason that human bites are so dirty. So if someone's teeth penetrate the skin of another person, then the bacteria from the biter's mouth can go into the tissues of the person that's being bitten. And these bacteria in that situation can cause quite nasty tissue infections, which is why we always give antibiotics prophylactically if there's a human bite. And again, we see that we have the mucous membrane in the mouth and in the, uh, the pharynx, which is this area behind the mouth as well. And because the mucus is sticky, inhaled viruses and bacteria will stick to it. And then when we blow our nose, those bacteria can be... Uh, can be expelled from the body. Now having said all this we do see quite a lot of infections in the mouth. Perhaps the most common one is, is fungal infections causing thrush which can sometimes cause white patches and uh, inflamed areas in the mouth often in patients that are uh, malnourished and also have dry mouths as well. So again very important to keep the mouth physically moist. And if there is any injuries in the mouth or dental work, dental extractions, for example, or other injuries to the mouth, then this moist environment promotes a, a moist wound healing environment. So injuries in the mouth normally heal uh, really quite quickly and quite readily. And it's uncommon for them to become infected. Now, moving down to the respiratory tract, again, it's all lined with the uh, mucous membrane producing mucus in the mucous membrane. It's also lined with cilia, these wafting projections from the surface of the uh, respiratory uh, epithelial cells that waft mucus up 
So the cilia in that lung will waft mucus in that direction. The cilia in that lung will waft, muc waft mucus in that direction. And that will waft it up there towards the, uh, towards the top of the trachea. And then when we cough, the explosive effect of the cough will push the mucus through the vocal cords up into the oropharynx. And once it's in the oropharynx, we can either choose to spit it out or we can choose to swallow it down into the, uh, into the esophagus where the bacteria will be broken down by the acidity and digestive enzymes in the stomach. So it's very important we have this mucus, that we have the wafting effects of the cilia, the mucociliary clearance system, and that we can cough. So for example, if someone smokes, that's going to reduce the motility of the cilia, and that's going to make chest infections more likely. Or if someone's got chronic bronchitis, there can be damage to the cilia over time. Again, reducing the efficiency of the mucociliary clearance system, meaning the mucus is not wafted out effectively. If the mucus is not wafted out effectively, we can get areas of stasis, of stagnant, stagnant stasis, area, static areas. And stasis uh, basically can always lead to infection. Stasis in the lungs certainly does. And this is why we get so many people in with chest infections. So very important to avoid the environmental pollutants like smoke and uh, wood smoke and cigarette smoke that paralyse the, the cilia, reduce the motility of the cilia. And also important to avoid these pollutants because they lead to um, chronic bronchitis and emphysema, which also has this um, effect of negating the normal innate mechanisms that the respiratory tract uh, normally enjoys. And sneezing also has this explosive effect of wafting things up and out through the vocal cords into the oropharynx where they can be swallowed. Now going down into the stomach, um, anything that's swallowed in the stomach can be degraded by the acids in the stomach. Uh, the pH in the stomach is around about 2. There's a lot of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. And the hydrochloric acid will cause unfolding of proteins, damage bacteria, and they can then be digested as, it, as if they're a food that we've eaten. Particular organisms that aren't well broken down by the stomach are the organisms which can cause food poisoning. But the vast majority of potential infective organisms are effectively killed by the acids and the, particularly the pepsin, the proteolytic digestive enzyme present in the stomach. And in the stomach and the small intestine, again, we're producing antibodies that are present in these mucous membranes, the immunoglobulin type A's, that help to protect us from infection. And it's estimated that the gastrointestinal tract in an adult will produce between three and five grams of this immunological protein per day. And then we go on down to the, uh, the large intestine here, the digestive system. The, uh, the, the large intestine is the colon. And it's very important in here that there are these commensal bacteria. And there's a great deal of publicity these days on what's called the microbiome. And the microbiome is very important for gut health. But we now know that the microbiome is associated with health in all aspects of the body, or we strongly suspect it is. So the microbiome has been suggested to play a role in obesity, for example, and, and even in, in mental health. So the microbiome is very important. And the way to encourage a diverse microbiome, which is, is the key to a healthy microbiome, is to eat a wide variety of fibrous foods, so a wide variety of fibre-containing foods, because it's the fibre residue that gets through to the colon and is acted on by, by the commensal bacteria. And this is also why these commensal bacteria is why some people are advocating for certain conditions of faecal transplants where um, bacteria from someone else's faeces is, is introduced into the colon, obviously after we've screened them for such things as HIV and uh, hepatitis B and C. So prebiotics are the fibrous material, and some people also advocate probiotics, which are basically uh, things like live yoghurt and uh, things that actually contain the bacterial spores, which can help to to repopulate the colon. But the main thing really is the prebiotics. The bacteria will get there on their own as long as we, we feed them properly with the appropriate diverse variety of fibrous foods. Now these tubes I've drawn here 
these are the these are the ureters coming down into the bladder. And what's important here is a one-way flow because we get flushing effects. So if someone's got urinary tract infections, UTIs, we advise they drink large amounts of water. Because the more water they drink, the more the water will be going down the ureters and coming out of the bladder, and that will physically wash bacteria uh, out of the body. So we have these flushing effects, these one-way flow effects. And sometimes children are born with a, with a deficit in this valve, the valve between the bladder and the ureter, the vesico ureteric valve. And what this means is when the child urinates, yes, some of the urine will go out the urethra as normal, but in a sense, they'll urinate up their ureters and some there'll be reflux of urine at one of the ureters where there's a weak valve. This will go to the kidneys. This can cause infection of the kidney. And in young children, this can cause permanent damage to the kidney by the mechanism of, uh, mechanism of chronic uh, pyelonephritis. So very important that we have this one-way flow. Stasis can lead to infection, retrograde flow due to anatomical and physiological abnormalities can also lead to infection. And in fact, these flushing effects can be seen all over the place. I mean, if someone has uh, got infection in their gastrointestinal tract in their stomach, for example, then do, do you want to keep it there? I mean, if you imagine you have something uh, really dirty in your hand, you think, oh, there's something really dirty in my hand now. I know what I'll do. I'm going to keep that. Of course not. You chuck it away. It's filthy. So it's the same thing. If there's, if there's infection in the stomach, you want to get rid of it and the stomach will contract. There'll be reverse peristalsis in the esophagus or controlled by the brain. And, and that will cause us to vomit. So vomiting is a perfectly natural defense mechanism. So is diarrhea. So if there's infection in the colon, again, do we, do we want to think, well, there's horrible infection in our colon. I know what to do, I'll keep it. No, you chuck it away. So, so anti-motility drugs will reduce the motility of the colon, leaving the bacteria in the colon, which means they can divide more and, and uh, proliferate to make the infection worse. The diarrhea is the natural flowing effect to get rid of it. It's exactly what we want. Same in a way with, with coughing and sneezing. We, we want to get rid of this material that we don't want from the lungs. We want this natural flow in this physiological direction to get rid of it. So remember, uh, do avoid treating the symptoms. So if someone's um, feeling sick, there's probably a reason for that. Only give them antiemetics, things to stop sickness, if you're sure the sickness is not caused by an infective agent. Same, same with diarrhea. Normally, we just want to get rid of it. Not give uh, anti-motility agents, as, as people often do, to treat the symptoms. Always make sure we're treating the underlying cause of the condition whenever we can, rather than the symptoms of the condition. And we notice going down, there's commensal bacteria and acids in the, uh, the vagina. And again, uh, fungal infections of the vagina are relatively common, which we want to treat those, of course, if we can, with, with antifungal uh, pessaries normally. But the commensal bacteria in the vagina can reduce the probability of that. This is why uh, people can get vaginal infections, uh, thrush particularly, the, the menilial fungal infections, after antibiotics because the commensal bacteria have been killed off by, by the antibiotics. So it just shows the importance of these normal, uh, the normal flora of the vagina which protects. And it's also now thought that during vaginal delivery of children that the the, uh, the bacteria from the mother's vagina are very important in stimulating immunological responses in the baby. Again, the mucous membranes, the vagina and the, uh, the, the, the uh, urethra in men and the prostate and the, the testes also have immunoglobulin type A to protect against uh, infection. And there's also some zinc, which is antibacterial in seminal fluid. And then perhaps the main one that we haven't mentioned yet are intact skin. Now the skin is moist and keratinized. It contains sebum that make it, keeps it moist. Sebum from the sebaceous glands associated with the hair follicles. So a moist skin associated with the keratin membrane keeps out most infections. And this is why if there's a large surface area in a burn, for example, that infection becomes very probable 
because we've taken away the normal intact integument. And it's also very important to have intact mucous membranes everywhere. Anywhere there's a mucous membrane, we want those to be intact. So to take an example, if the integrity of the genital mucosa is interrupted by a sexually transmitted disease of a bacterial nature, and that damages the mucosa of the male or female uh, genital tract, then that makes HIV infection much more likely if someone's exposed to it. Because if the mucous membrane is already damaged, the HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, can get in through the areas of injury already caused by the pre-existing bacterial infection. That's why if we treat existing sexually transmitted diseases with antibiotics, the bacterial ones, we can reduce the transmission of HIV as well. So it just shows the importance of having intact skin and intact uh, mucous membranes. And we could add to this the, uh, the lymphatic system. Uh, the lymphatic system, which we've looked at in previous videos also, is, is a flowing system where bacteria are taken away from areas of injury, going through uh, lymph nodes, perhaps in the axilla or in the groin, before the lymphatic fluid is, is returned to the blood. So all these are acting against a wide variety of organisms. That's why they're innate. That's why they are non-specific mechanisms. Now the con converse of the innate immunity is the specific immunity which has to be acquired, which is what we want to look at next.